The popularity of consumer drones has meant that there are a lot of folks who have kind of slid into photography. They might have bought a drone because it looked like a fun device and then discovered just how epic it is for taking photographs. Problem is that when you're new to photography, it's easy to let the camera do all the heavy lifting. Shooting JPEG in automatic is the path of least resistance. And I can fully understand when novice photographers do this. But there is another way and it's really not as hard as it looks. And so that's what this video is all about. It's aimed at folks with no background in photography who'd like to learn how to process the images they're taking with their drones. keep things simple, I'm going to make this a three-part series. In the first part, we're looking at stills, and in the next two parts, we'll look firstly at panos, both flat and sphere, and secondly, at multi-shot images such as HDRs. So without further jabber, let's get into it. The first thing we need to briefly explain is why the title of this video says RAW Photographs. If you want to make the leap from automatic modes and take control of your aerial drone photography, then you need to be shooting in RAW mode. With a JPEG, all of the visual information is baked into the photo and there's very little you can do afterwards to process it or correct any issues with the photo. RAW photographs, however, are literally like digital negatives. You can do way more with a RAW, including saving blown out or underexposed images. RAW is the gold standard of photographs and if you want to get the most out of your drone it's what you should be shooting in. When you edit a RAW file everything you do is non-destructive which means you can revisit that image at any time, make some new edits and then output a fresh JPEG for sharing online or printing. If you're worried about messing things up then simply set your drone to photograph in the JPEG plus RAW mode. This mode saves both versions on the memory card. The first thing you're going to need is an application for processing your RAW photographs. There are hundreds of applications that will do this on all platforms including smartphones and tablets, but most people usually opt for one of five top applications. I use the Adobe suite of applications which includes Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. Other excellent options include Capture One, DxO Photo Lab, Luminar AI, ACDC Photo Studio, Affinity Photo and On One Photo Raw. There are trial versions available for all of these apps, so I suggest you just give them a go and see which one seems the most intuitive to you. If you can afford a monthly subscription of the Adobe Photography Bundle, I strongly recommend it because Lightroom and Camera Raw are the gold standard of raw editors. And since Lightroom is also an incredibly versatile image cataloging system, it's great for managing and sorting all your drone photographs as well. Whichever raw editor you end up getting, they all have the same core features that enable you to unlock the image data hidden away inside a raw image. So don't stress too much about it. That said, if you want to follow along with exactly what I'm doing, then I'm using Adobe Lightroom Classic. The first thing I do when processing any image is to check for dust spots and other gremlins that might be lurking in the background. Often these spots are quite noticeable and you can use the spot removal tool to get rid of them. Just hit the Q key in Lightroom and dab them away. You can increase and decrease the size of the brush with the square bracket keys. Normally you want a bit of room beyond the radius of the dust spot to get a clean removal. If you make the brush size exactly the same size as the spot, you'll see the edges of the patch. There will probably be other spots lurking in the image that you can't see immediately and to find those you need to enable the visual spots option. Use the slider to increase the visibility of the spots and then dab them away with the brush. Now that the image is cleaned up, you should also make sure the horizon is level. Lightroom's crop tool serves a dual purpose for cropping and straightening. Alternatively, click on the spirit level icon and drag across the screen in line with the horizon to get it perfectly straight.
Have you ever taken a photograph and found that it looks colder than it actually was? Or alternatively found everything looks like it was shot on the sun? Those photographs probably look that way because the drone was in automatic white balance mode and it made a bad guess about the warmth or the coolness of the natural light. In photography, light is measured in degrees Kelvin. Getting that white balance right is often all it takes to fix a photograph. And the good news is that with a RAW file, you can change this instantly in the editor. But how are you supposed to know what the right temperature is? Well, a good starting point is that 5,500 Kelvin is the median daylight color. If you're photographing during the day, it's always a safe number to pick. You can let the raw editor guess the color temperature too. And the odds are it will do a better job than your drone. Simply select auto white balance and see how it goes. I sometimes use auto white balance as a starting point just to get an idea of which way to push the sliders. Being able to set the white balance of a raw image anywhere in the color range is a one click fix for changing the entire mood of your photograph. If you'd like your photograph to look like it was taken on a warm day, then nudge the white balance slider to the right until you find a temperature that works for you. Similarly, if the image is too warm, then you can crank the white balance slider to the left and into the cooler color range. Whatever color temperature you decide to use for a photograph, always lock it in first because it sets the mood for everything that follows. Some of the sliders in a RAW editor have an obvious use. If you crank that saturation slider all the way to the right, perhaps because you were about to upload a photograph to Instagram, then you know what the outcome will be. Black and white sliders have a more mysterious purpose, but they can have just as big an impact on correctly processing an image as the white balance slider. The first thing to state is that while tweaking these sliders does increase contrast in an image, that is not their purpose. These sliders are there to set the true black and white points in your image. Hold down the Option key on Mac or Alt on Windows and drag that white slider to the right. The area that's highlighted when you do this is set to 100% pure white, ditto with the black slider. Quite often the only thing that's wrong with a photograph is that the white and black points have not been set correctly. The key with these sliders, as with so many in RAW editors, is to not go crazy with them. There will be portions of your image, such as a light flare on a chrome bumper, that's supposed to be pure white. And if you push the white slider too far, then areas such as this will appear unnatural. Remember that some images are supposed to have areas of 100% black and 100% white. While the black and white sliders can reveal previously hidden areas of your photograph, if it's overexposed or underexposed, then the highlight and shadow sliders are your go-to tools. These sliders enable you to pull out image data that's otherwise hidden away in the brightest and darkest parts of the image. When using these, remember to keep the image looking natural. Sometimes a blown out shot looks better than an image with the highlights dropped too far because it creates a fixed edge to the blowout. If you use these sliders in combination with the white and black sliders, you'll be amazed at what's lurking in a badly exposed image. Okay, so all the tweaks we've made so far are concerned with the tone or light in the image. And now that we've balanced that, we can begin tweaking the image's granularity or presence as Adobe referred to it. All raw editors have these sliders, but some of them use slightly different names. Now, because drone photographs are typically wide angle shots taken from some distance up in the air, I'd advise you to tread carefully when it comes to the clarity and texture sliders. In most cases, all these will do to your wide angle shot taken with that wide angle lens is to add noise and grain to your image. If you want your photograph to have more contrast, then this is not the way to go about it. If, however, you've used your drone to photograph something that's quite close to the lens, then a dab of clarity will work. The dehaze slider, however, is another kettle of fish entirely. I use a small amount of dehaze on pretty much every drone shot I take. In fact, I'd argue that the dehaze slider could have been designed expressly for drones. Why? Well, think about where your drone is when it takes a photograph. It's further up in the atmosphere than a standard camera would be, and therefore right in the middle of atmospheric pollution, cloud, fog, haze, you name it. The dehaze slider is great for shots taken during the day, 
and also excellent for improving shots that include lots of artificial light. With great power comes great responsibility though, so don't go mental with that DHA slider. Always err on the side of caution. Finally, we have the Vibrance and Saturation sliders, the two most overused sliders in the history of photo processing. And what you may be asking is the difference between the two. The answer is that saturation affects all pixels, while vibrance only targets the less dominant ones. You should tread carefully when using either of these sliders because the further to the right you push either of them, the shittier your photograph will become. If you push them too far to the right, then they'll start looking like complete garbage. Try and remain faithful to the scene you photograph by keeping the saturation at believable levels. And when you're testing these sliders on your photo, always start with vibrance first and leave the saturation slider alone completely if you can manage it. One of the best ways of improving a drone photo is to increase the level of detail in the image. Lightroom and other raw editors have detail enhancement tools, but you might want to consider an external app for this process. In Lightroom, you'll find the sharpening tool within the details section, and you'll find that it has four sliders, a mount, radius, blending, and masking. Now, the trick with this is that you only want to add that sharpening to the edges of the myriad structures, large and small, within your image. And you do that by using the masking tool. Turn the amount slider up to about 90%, and then hold down the Option key on Mac or Alt on Windows, and slide that masking slider over to the right. Keep moving that slider to the right until only the edges of the objects are showing in the photograph. It depends on the photo, but I usually push that slider almost to 100%. To keep the effect clean and subtle, leave the radius and detail sliders in their default locations, but if you really want to boost the sharpness, then increase the radius, no more than two should do it, and the detail, about 50, will do the job. While sharpening in Lightroom is great, I often use Topaz Labs Sharpen AI because it does a much more comprehensive job. The only problem with this is that Sharpen AI can't work with raw images and will convert it to a bitmap TIFF file. This means that sharpening is always the last thing I do before doing a final export of the finished image. Now, all of the changes I've mentioned above can safely be applied to an entire image so long as you don't go crazy with the sliders. However, if you want to take it to the next level, then you should use Mask to process the sky and the land separately. The latest version of Lightroom has some very clever AI masks that accurately select the sky and the land automatically. I use these masks on most images because, for instance, I do not want any sharpening to take place in the sky. Clouds don't have sharp edges. If you do use masks, then you can level up again by applying highly specific edits to much smaller regions of the photograph. But this is an in-depth topic I'll save for another video. So those are the main adjustments I make to my drone shots in Lightroom. <laughs> Now let's go over some of the optional enhancements that I sometimes use. Now, firstly, the only preset I ever use is my own, which has some baseline adjustments I make to all images. Presets are, for the most part, awful. Those preset packs sold by influencers are a colossal waste of money because they apply a rigid set of changes to photographs that have absolutely no bearing on what actually needs tweaking. Save your money and do it yourself. If I finish processing a photograph and think it needs a little bit more saturation, then I open up the calibration tab and apply a small amount of rocket fuel to the blue and green channels. Usually only about 15 or 20 in the blue and no more than five in the green. Finally, I often apply a subtle vignette to the image to draw the viewer's eye in towards the center. To add a vignette, open the effects tab in Lightroom and drag the amount slider no further than 10% to the left. Remember, this is a subtle effect, and if you overdo it, it will look like you're viewing your image through the middle of a toilet roll. So those are the kind of general tweaks that I make to my drone photographs. Lightroom and all the other raw editors can do much, much more than that, of course. 
But the steps I've outlined here are the baseline edits I do on pretty much all of mine. If you've never processed a raw photo before, then just take it step by step and always err on the side of caution when it comes to those sliders, particularly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, the saturation one. All right, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the two follow-up videos on panos and multi-shot images because I think they're often the best kinds of drone photos. If you enjoyed this video and got value from it, please hit the old like button down there and consider subscribing to see more of my content in your YouTube feed. Till the next time, guys. Ta-ta.